8 o'clock. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark Cards bring you Jane Wyman in Trenton 76 on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories and presents as your host one of the most distinguished actors of the American theater, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lionel Barrymore. Tonight we're going to take you back to some very early and very stirring days in our nation's history. Our story is a dramatization of a book written by Elizabeth Burbridge and Robert Lee Johnson, appropriately and simply titled Trenton, 76, and relates the events that took place in Trenton, New Jersey, in that fateful year of 1776. It was a year of crisis, a year of war, a year of evaluation and reckoning. To play our heroine tonight, we have invited that charming and talented actress, Jane Wyman. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card, and you'll find the card you want to send. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it, with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Bad and the Beautiful, starring Lana Turner, Kirk Douglas, Walter Pidgeon, and Dick Powell. And now here's the first act of Trenton 76, starring Jane Wyman. In the summer of 1776, Piety Pettigrew was a widow, young, attractive, and quite well off. Her fortune was famous as her face and figure, and many a bachelor in the settlement of Trenton sighed on her doorstep. But who did she favor? Well, let's see what the lady herself had to say on the subject. I wasn't interested in marriage at all in the summer of 76. I had the problems I couldn't handle to run my farm. My hands had deserted me to join Washington's Rebels Army, and in order to get a man to work the farm, I had no choice but to go to an auction to purchase a bondsman. My Aunt Tabitha was scandalized at the idea. Patty, you surely are not going to purchase one of those cutthroats. Aunt Tabitha, I must have a man to work the farm, and there's none to be hired right now. If I don't harvest the crops, I won't have any money to pay the taxes. And if I don't pay the taxes, I'll lose the farm. Why don't you accept me as Switzer's proposal and let him worry about the farm? Because I don't love him. Love? Now, I want you to listen to me. If you think Oh, not you're now, Aunt Tabitha. Come on, we're going to be late. The auction was conducted in the town square by the mayor. Quite a crowd had gathered but the gentleman stepped aside so that Aunt Tabitha and I could make our way to the front. The mayor was startled to see us, to say the least. Well, ladies, this is most unexpected. Would you care to step closer and inspect the merchandise? The merchandise referred to was a group of men in the most pitiful condition imaginable. They were bearded, dirty, and painfully thin. For one guinea, ten shillings, I purchased a piece of merchandise known as Jotham Vale. I took him home, 
gave him some fresh clothes and sent him to bathe and shave. And then I sat down to wait for our first interview together. Come in. Your servant, ma'am. Oh, come in. Well, I, I must say, you look a great deal better. I had no idea you were so young and... Uh, well, never mind that. Now then, I'd like to explain your chores. I want to make it very plain at the start that you need not expect to take advantage of me because I'm a woman. I'm mistress of this manor, and I will have you punished if there are any infractions of my orders. You need hardly fear any infractions on my part, mistress. I have read the law in regard to my position. The law? Oh, yes, there is a law, mistress. It's quite explicit. For disobedience, any number up to ten lashes across the bare back. <gasps> For theft, the severance of a hand. Oh, no, don't, don't tell me any more. I, I had no idea. On the other hand, consider what we are. The slops and dregs from English prisons, vagrants, thieves, rebels against the king. What, uh, what were you? There is no penalty stated in the law for refusing to talk of the past. Your concern is with my present behavior, mistress, and my future. But you're quite correct, Jotham. Come, I'll show you about the farm. I could have spared myself any worry about whether Jotham would work. He took a personal pride in getting the farm in working order and keeping it that way. But the dark, disturbing sounds of war kept coming closer. Late in August, news came to Trenton that General Washington and his rebel troops were in possession of Brooklyn Heights. The revolution was beginning to assume serious proportions. We were told that King George had hired Hessian soldiers to come over to defend us. That meant more taxes. And we were notified that if we were unable to meet the tax, our lands would be forfeit to the crown. I knew what that would make it in, in human toil, because I was raised on a farm, and I knew that Jotham could never do it alone. My freedom was far more important to me than my dignity, and I clothed myself in homespun once again and joined Jotham in the fields. You're a good helpmate, mistress. You have strength. You have endurance. These have been long, weary days. Oh, I've not found them so. I love the land. There's a sense of fulfillment and accomplishment that comes with the harvest of a good crop. It's like no other feeling in the world. I agree. Oh, if I could have what you have now, I'd have my life's fulfillment. A plot of free land, my house on the land, my nourishment coming from deep within its soil. To be master of your own plot of land in sky and sun and rain, surely... There's no deeper peace, no richer satisfaction. Yet, think how easy it is to lose. If I can't meet the taxes, I forfeit the land. You won't forfeit it. The land itself assures you that. We, you, will have more than enough grain to pay the tax. We will have enough grain, Jotham. I could never have done it alone. Mistress Pettigrew, I must commend your industry. I compliment you upon settling your account with the crown. Here is your receipt. Thank you, Mayor Switchell. As a loyal subject, you will be happy to learn that things are going well with us. The Hessian regiments attacked the garrison at Fort Washington and captured nearly 3,000 American prisoners. Oh, that is welcome news. Perhaps this war will be over soon and we can settle down to peace again. You're very quiet, Jotham. You haven't spoken a word since we started home. There is much on my mind, mistress. I am afraid I cannot view the news of today in the same spirit of rejoicing that you regard it. But why? The quicker the war is over, the better. The longer it goes on, the more suffering. Peace is the important thing, Jotham. What good is peace without freedom, mistress? These are the king's colonies, Jotham. You're talking treason. Is it treason to want to be free? Is it it's treasonable to revolt against the king or, or to sympathize with those who are revolting? Mistress, you speak of an old loyalty, sadly outmoded, behind the times. I say it is far more treasonable to be of your sympathies for your treasons directed against the liberty of your own countrymen, yourself. You have no right to speak to me like that. 
We'll say no more about it. Yes, mistress. I was troubled at what Jotham had said and did not speak to him again the rest of the day. Late that night, I was awakened as Aunt Tabitha came screaming into my room. Hi, Someone's prowling through the house. It's that bondsman. He's going to murder us all. I know he's going to murder us in our sleep. Oh, I could hear someone moving about all right, and I followed the sounds down to the kitchen. I came in one door as Jotham entered the other, and both of us stopped in amazement. There at the kitchen table sat a ragged young man stuffing himself on the remains of our dinner. Well, what is this? Who are you, and what are you doing here? Forgive me for taking liberties with your kitchen, but I haven't had a meal in days. I'm trying to make my way back to my regiment. Are you one of Washington's men? Aye, that I am. And I've pledged to fight until every lobster back goes home where he came from. Jotham, keep this man under guard. We'll take him to the authorities in the morning. You mean you're not a patriot, mistress? I'm a loyalist, and I hardly consider patriot the proper word for you. Get out of here, boy. Go as fast Jotham, as you can. Jotham, I have orders. Can you hear me, boy? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. How dare you ignore my orders? It's my duty to turn that man over to the authorities. Now, go after him at once or I'll have you arrested. Mistress, whether you like it or not, Washington and his army are fighting for your liberty as well as their own. Why this loyalty to King George? He's shown no respect for the person or property of any colonist. You'll be punished for this. I'm well used to punishment, mistress. You asked me once what my crime was. Perhaps you should know now. I was tried in England for treason. <laughs> Treason? Yes. I was sentenced to servitude for rebelling against the tyranny of the crown. You purchased a traitor on the auction block, mistress. I will not run away. Do with me what you will. Oh, you should have escaped with your friend, for you will take his punishment in the morning. Turn to the second act of Trenton 76, starring Jane Wyman. Last night, my little niece asked me a question which was pretty important to her. Uncle Frank, she said, do you think the policeman at our school crossing would like a valentine from me? <laughs> well, I said I was sure he would, because a valentine would let him know how much he is appreciated. And even as I answered her, this thought occurred to me. Most children enjoy being thoughtful of others. All they need is a bit of encouragement to turn their little acts of thoughtfulness into a lifelong habit. This week, many of you will take your boys and girls valentine shopping. And when you do, I suggest you visit a store where Hallmark cards are sold. You see, the makers of Hallmark cards have learned through the years exactly what kind of valentines little folks like to send. There are amusing ones just made to drop into a valentine box at school... Bright ones to delight aunts and uncles and grandparents and special Hallmark Valentines for the most important people of all, mother and dad. Yes, and here's a tip for you. You can choose all the juvenile Valentines you'll want to send the youngsters this year from the big Hallmark collection. Remember, the Hallmark on the back means, as always, you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to Lionel Barrymore in the second act of Trenton 76, starring Jane Wyman. <laughs> The widow, Petty Grew, was having a very difficult night. She locked Jotham in his quarters and then started back up to bed with Aunt Tabitha trotting tearfully along beside her. It was a strange, strange night, that winter night of 76. I felt all mixed up about Jotham. I put myself in a position where I was going to have to punish him, and I didn't want to, even though I was quite sure he deserved it. My word. Now, what is that? Who would come to the front door at this hour? It will soon be dawn. Open the window, call down, see who it is. Who is it? It's Mary Switzer, Mrs. Pettigrew. I've come to warn you. Yes? About what? The rumor of the victory over Washington's rebels was false. 
General Washington is marching on Trenton with 4,000 men. Protect your property, mistress. Only heaven knows what looting, pillaging, murdering we will see this night. Jotham, I'm unlocking the door. Jotham, I must talk to you. It's scarcely dawn. You're certainly in a great hurry to have me whipped, mistress. General Washington is marching on Trenton. I want you to help me drive the livestock into hiding. At dawn, I stood by the roadside and saw the ragged columns of Washington's army marching into Trenton. At first, I wanted to run and lock myself behind doors, but I forced myself to stay. The men marched silently, looking straight ahead. They were ragged, starved. Their faces were pinched with cold. Their hands seemed almost frozen to the muskets they carried. Some wore battered boots. Some marched with their feet wrapped in sacking. Not a shot was fired or exchanged. Not a word was uttered until suddenly in the distance... Hooray for George Washington! Hooray! see tears on your cheeks, mistress? Jotham, you, you see far more than you're supposed to see. But do you see what you are supposed to see? I'm beginning to wonder. Oh, Jotham, for the first time, I'm beginning to wonder. Why was I beginning to wonder? I hardly knew myself. Was it a spark I caught from Jotham when he talked of freedom? Was it the fierce pride of the soldier I caught rifling my kitchen? Or was it the determination on the thin faces of men who marched with their feet bound in sacking because they lacked shoes? They could have been warm. They could have been fed. They could have had proper clothes. To have these things, they had only to give up what they considered liberty. Had I given up liberty? Had I forgotten what liberty was? Oh, yes, I, I was beginning to wonder. Oh, Mayor Switchell. Mistress, may I present Colonel Rawl, who is in command of His Majesty's Hessian troops. The Colonel is paying you a singular honor. He wishes to have quarters in your house and to have accommodations for several of his men. <laughs> Mistress, it's not safe for you to be wandering around the grounds like this after dark. Is it safe anywhere in this country today, Jotham? Do you actually think I'm safer in that house full of Hessian soldiers? I would like to kill every one of them. Oh, so would I, but what good would that do? Listen, there are the church bells. It's Christmas Eve. I never thought we should be spending Christmas with a house full of soldiers. They were down in the cellar when I left the house, looting it, going through everything, hunting for something to drink. Well, they won't find it. They won't need to. Did you see those barrels that just went in through the front door a little while ago? Oh, this will be going on in every house in Trenton that quarters them tonight. It seems that's their custom at Christmas. Wait a minute. Washington's army is just across the Delaware. They're waiting for a chance, a moment. They can seize and turn to advantage. Suppose, suppose this was it. A town full of drunken soldiers. Jotham, could you get through to General Washington? There are still sentinels on duty. I can try, mistress. Is it your wish? But I... I don't know. You don't know? I thought you'd changed in your allegiance as mistress. I thought you were with us. Oh, I am with you, but but if you go, it would be very dangerous. Oh. Oh, if I were free, what... what I would say to you this moment. But you are free. Whatever freedom is mine, I give to you. My dear. Oh, God, go with you and bring you safely home. I watched Jotham mount his horse and ride away. I knew at last that I had found what I'd been waiting for, the one man I must marry. Not until he disappeared in the distance did I turn back to the house. Ah, Mistress Pettigrew, we have been waiting for you to come and join our party. I went in and tried to appear a part of their gaiety, 
but my mind and heart were riding through the thick snows of the forest towards Washington and his men camped along the Delaware. A starving army huddled for warmth in thin, chill tents. A lonely general trying to see through darkness, trying to find the way of peace on Earth. Come, dance with us, Mr. Spectacle, dance with us. I don't know how long I danced. I know that my face ached from smiling and my throat ached with fear. And suddenly there was a commotion. The music stopped and Jotham was flung into the room. What is the meaning of this? We caught this man trying to escape across the river. He said he belonged here. Is this your servant, Mistress Pettigrew? Yes, it is, Colonel Rawl. Well, he was trying to run away. Did you make any contact with the rebel troops across the river? Answer me. I warn you, any man who refuses to give a full account of his movements when I ask will find himself facing a firing squad. Colonel Rawl, this is not a military matter. This man is my slave, and it's up to me to punish him for running away. He should be executed for insolence, if nothing else. And what good is he to me dead? What's my crime against you that you should destroy my property? You're guests in my house. I've made you welcome. Well, that is all true enough, mistress. Very well. It is your privilege to sentence the prisoner. And you will please do so without delay. Oh, ten... Ten lashes. Take him away and administer the lashes. <laughs> and uh, now, back to the dance. The party continued. All the parties continued in houses all over Trenton. And by nightfall on December 25th, the Hessians were much the worse for wear. Shadowy figures began to appear in the streets. The sound of rifle was heard, and the bellowing, indignant voice of the king's mayor. We're under attack! Help someone! Help! We're under attack! Yes, we have won. Oh, and you helped win. General Washington said that until you arrived, he was at his wit's end. If I had not arrived, he would have thought of something else. Oh, there's no need to be modest. We've taken the city of Trenton, and you should be very proud. We've won our first victory. Oh, the street's full of people, and look, I see a good share of Tories out there singing with the soldiers. Former Tories, like you. Mistress Pettigrew, today you have given me my freedom. Yes, John. And now, since it is my most priceless possession, I, I offer it to you. Will you have me as your husband? With all my heart, Jotham. Oh, darling. Darling. Oh, Jotham, you remember you once said... There's no deeper peace, no richer satisfaction than to be master of your own plot of land. The sky, the sun, and the rain. This is the happiness I want to share with you, Jotham. For always. Simon and Lionel Barrymore will return in a moment. Have you ever known a grown-up who didn't get a thrill out of an unexpected valentine? It's almost magic the way a white square envelope delivered on February 14th can light up the gloomiest day. And you know, choosing valentines is just as much fun as receiving them, especially if you visit a store where Hallmark cards are sold. You'll find there's a Hallmark valentine to fit the personality of everyone dear to you. 
humorous styles, sentimental ones, and old-fashioned lacy valentines that recall the memories of bygone days. First, you'll want to select a hallmark valentine for the person you love most. A valentine with a special message that says what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And then you can choose valentines for all the others, your brother in service, your aunt in Maine, or the neighbor who helped take care of you when you were ill. Yes, it's a joy to make Valentine's Day a day of loving kindness all the way around. And when the hallmark is there, on the back of each and every one, it will tell your friends, you care enough to send the very best. Here again is Lionel Barrymore. Jane Wyman, thank you for another wonderful performance. You know, I always look forward to your visits to the Hallmark Playhouse. As a matter of fact, you seem like one of our Hallmark family. Well, I feel like one of the family, Mr. Barrymore, because don't forget, I'm a Hallmark artist, too. Oh, yes, yes. I'm very proud of the fact that my paintings were chosen to be reproduced on Hallmark Christmas cards. And very pretty paintings, too, I might add. Thank you, Mr. Barrymore. That's nice to hear. <laughs> and now, Janie, I've got some very interesting and exciting news about our Hallmark radio program. Starting next week, at this same time and on these very same stations, the Hallmark Playhouse is going to be transformed into the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And from then on, every week we'll present a new series of stories that'll give us a fascinating glimpses into the lives of great men and women. Will all of them be famous people, Mr. Barrymore? <laughs> well, now, it depends on how you evaluate fame, Janie. Because lots of the men and women who will enter our Hallmark Radio Hall of Fame will be people who have earned fame, perhaps, without receiving it. Men and women who have made great sacrifices or maintained great ideals or who have contributed behind the scenes to making life richer and happier for all of us. It sounds ideal for the whole family, Mr. Barrymore, since your stories will be both entertaining and inspiring. And you can count on my family as regular listeners. What will be your opening story on the Hallmark Radio Hall of Fame? Well, Jane, it's a story of rousing adventure and of a man whose steadfast faith helped assure the progress and prosperity of America. His name was Henry Miller Shreve of whom General Andrew Jackson said, you have brought civilization and humanity to an American frontier. It's the story, too, of his brave young wife, Mary, who was with him on his thrilling trip up to Mississippi. And I guarantee we'll have you on the edge of your seat. Remember, next week, be sure to listen to the Hallmark Radio Hall of Fame. Our producer director is William Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our story tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> For Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card, one you carry enough to send the very best. Jane Wyman appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers, producers of The Jazz Singer, starring Danny Thomas and Peggy Lee. The role of Jotham was played by Lamont Johnson, with Virginia Gregg as Aunt Tabitha, Polly Bayer as the mayor, Ted DeCorsi as the colonel, and Ben Wright as the soldier. Every Sunday, Hallmark cards present two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. On radio, the Hallmark Radio Hall of Fame with host Lionel Barrymore. And on television, Sarah Churchill brings you outstanding dramatic entertainment on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time and every week thereafter when Lionel Barrymore will be your host on the Hallmark Radio Hall of Fame. Bringing you fascinating glimpses into the lives of real men and women as you hear of the actual events that molded their lives. Next week, Mr. Barrymore will relate the story of Henry Miller Shreve on the Hallmark Radio Hall of Fame. Be sure to hear it. This is the CBS Radio Network. 
This is KMVC, Kansas City, Missouri.